Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to Silent Fire, the podcast edition. Uh, I'm here with Colin Nicole of St. Mary and St. John, the Anglican churches here in Summerside and St. Eleanor's. And I'm Josh Hoffert uh, with Wind Ministries. Uh, So you can find out more about Wind Ministries at windministries.ca. You can check out the Silent Fire website, silentfire.ca. Uh, you can find more about early church fathers and desert fathers on the website. You can go to the desertfathers.ca, all kinds of resources. So look us, look us up on Facebook. Uh, before we get started, like, share, subscribe, uh, all those types of things. Uh, we, really, we really love um, the conversations that are starting because of this. Yeah. And so we just want to see uh, more of that and uh, be a blessing to you. And so you can find out more about Colin at, uh, at stmaryandstjohn.com, and so that'll link you to the Facebook page that I still don't remember the, the address <laughs> of, but uh, you can find us at stmaryandstjohn.com. Yeah, and you can look up Colin Nicole That's right. on Facebook yeah. as well. So last name is with two L's, though. And an E. And an E at the end, e. yes. Yeah, yeah. Colin. So it's it's kind of two first names, but kind of not. because it, it is. It, yeah, it really... every, everyone always says it together. Everyone has to say Colin Nicole. Colin Nicole, sort of yes. rolls right, right together. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've thought about going by Joshua Peter. That's my middle name. Oh, that's yeah, nice. you know, good ring to it. Colin Nicole. So yeah, N I C O L L E. So yep. you can look him up that way and find out uh, more there. Uh, so, if, but if you go to SilentFire.ca, you'll see all that information is on the website there. So, um, call, so Colin, today uh, we thought we'd talk about uh, the last episode. We talked about yeah. the mystery of God and how um, God is really unknowable, and that keeps us in faith and mm-hmm. and. Um, keeps us in prayer and keeps us pursuing something that we just don't know. It seems mm-hmm. beyond the edge of mm-hmm. our grasp, right? Yeah. Um, we see through a, uh, a mirror darkly, as mm-hmm. Paul says, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's just something that's almost like something you, something you can touch and feel and perceive, but you just, just can't quite figure out what it is, yeah. right? Yeah. And God is mystery. Um, yeah. But it doesn't just end there, no. uh, because those scripture talks significantly about God as mystery. He dwells in unapproachable light. No one has ever seen the face of God and lived. Even Moses, he only sees the backside of mm-hmm, God, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, the clouds and everything. Yeah, the clouds. That yeah. Psalm 18 says he surrounds himself yeah. with thick clouds of darkness. Mm-hmm. So there's all, this, there's all this language around God being imperceptible, imperceivable. Mm-hmm. Um, and even, even I, I love the when you look at the, the moment in the Israelites' history... Uh, Mount Sinai, where God came really to be known by them, right? right? And he says, tell them all to consecrate themselves and come to the mountain. And they go, no, 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 we're too scared. Mm -hmm. Moses, you go. Mm -hmm. And so God was coming to reveal himself to them, but all they had seen was really what looked like a powerful tyrant. Yeah. Like if you think about all the, like they saw the plagues, sure, they saw, sure, sure. they didn't listen to the history where they had Abraham being led by him. They had Joseph mm-hmm. being led by him. They just saw, my goodness, we're, we're afraid because he's so powerful. Yeah, I'd be pretty nervous to go up there. Yeah, that's too. right. So they, so they, they preferred to keep him at the mysterious level. Yeah. But Moses had a, had a moment where he began to know mm. who, God, so God's knowledge in the old Testament was metered out through the law. Right. And through the prophets, you know, that's what, and Jesus mm-hmm. says mm-hmm. that in as much sure. um, that, that love is summed up in the law and the prophets, and God is love. Mm-hmm. So he's known through the law and the prophets, but in the New Testament, where we know God, and his, God, is, is, God is mystery, uh, but in the New Testament it says that Christ has come mm-hmm. to explain him, right. to declare him. Yes. He who was in the bosom of the Father has come to declare him to us, and, mm-hmm. or to make him known to us. So I find that dichotomy really interesting. Mm-hmm. That uh, and I think the early church fathers would say something like, and especially looking at Dionysius, who we talked about last time, would say something like, "God in His essence is unknowable, right. yet in His nature desires to be known." They'd mm-hmm. say something along those lines, yeah. where you've got oh, and and essence type things they would look at, where God is spirit. That's an mm-hmm. essence. He is. That's the essence of who He is. That's something you just can't hope to no. perceive or pierce. God is love. And, you know, I, I love, I think it's Dionysius who basically says that if God is love, you don't actually see that love. Mm-hmm. You see how that love impacts creation in the world. Sure, sure. So your perception of him is based on the outworking of the character traits. And I, and I don't know if we talked about this in the last video, uh, if we used it as an example or not, but 
but you can't not notice uh josh showed in the we did a live video just before this uh this episode started you can't help but notice you know in a church like this we're surrounded by stained glass windows yes. and that's a great example i think of the same or an image of it at least where you know we don't see the light through the window but we know the light is there by the fact that we can see right. we can see these beautiful windows right and and uh but yet there is something kind of unknowable about the right behind it, if that's all you know. Yeah, it struck me actually when I was in, I was in an Anglican uh, cathedral in Nova Scotia mm. and we were there at night. I, I just didn't even think about it because, I mean, just charismatic church stained glass windows aren't part mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. culture, right? That at night it just was black. Right, right. Yeah. And I was like, oh, what? Like, well, I can't see all the, <laughs> right. <laughs> unless yeah. it's illuminated. So it's a great analogy. Unless yeah. it's illuminated, you don't actually see it. Yeah. And that's and that's that's the life of faith too. Mm, and that's mm. unless Jesus comes. Well, first, unless the law and the prophets explain something about God, yeah. and then unless Jesus comes and declares who God is, mm. there's no possible way you could hope to know him. Because how yeah. how could you? Yeah. And I love. I was I was listening to a podcast um, recently, and one of the guys he said something to the effect that um, the the early church fathers, when they talked about God as mystery. They didn't use the term the same way we would think of the term today, mysterious, right. something that something that um, is is vague and incoherent, mm -hmm. or you know something like that. Um, it, it was a, a mystery in the sense to be sought out, and he's not unknowable in his mysteriousness. He's because he's what he's knowable through is the revealed word, right? Which is of course scripture, yes. and then you've got tradition and how tradition approaches that. Sure. So, hmm. um, so I guess how what does it mean? We talked again. We talked a lot about the mystery. What does it mean to you, the pursuit of knowing Him? What does knowledge look like to you when it comes to the pursuit of God and the knowledge of Him? What what, what does that make you think about? Um, I mean, it makes me think about in a big way how we, uh, I think, just like uh, encounter God in a daily way. For for me, it's yeah. always been about that. It's it's knowing, uh, you know, in those trying moments when when things are difficult. Uh, sometimes we, or also in our lives, we see things as coincidental that in hindsight, mm -hmm. we tend to look back and we think, whoa, you know, wait a minute. Um, and I think the knowledge of God is, is actually in some sense, it's like just the knowledge of the presence of God being with you. Right. I, I don't know if that, you know, um, if I'm saying that quite right, but like, um, like I've most known God through, you know, the moments where I felt uh, most upheld by God, where I felt that presence in some form of, you know, protecting me. Um, right. And I, I, I felt it too, you know, when I've, when I've read, when I've studied the scriptures, when I've, um, you know, read the fathers or read, uh, read theology and that sort of thing. But there is something I think about that sense of presence of, of, um, well, like you said before Emmanuel, like the God with us, right. This sort of imminence, uh, of God in our lives is, uh, I think is where I, I tend to sort of experience that, that knowledge and that presence. Most. Right. Yeah. Right. When well, he, he is, he is, it's interesting that that's, you you perceive something, and I, I'm just playing on that, yeah. in moments of prayer, I love David's language in, in the Psalms. He talks about how he was meditating and his heart was hot within him. Right. right? As, right. He, as he's meditating about the, the, um, the limit of his humanity, basically, mm -hmm. is, the, is what he says. Teach me to know, number my days, he says. Mm -hmm. But his, the medita with, the, with the meditation, as he's thinking about this thing, he's got this burning sensation, something going on within him, yeah. right? He, he feels his presence with him yeah. is what the language looks like to me anyway. And that's something, it, it's, you, it's funny because you perceive something in that moment, but you, you can't articulate it. No, There's not no, necessarily no, no, no. language to say that, no. I mean, it, it sounds funny to say my heart was hot within me. Yeah. But, but that, anybody that's had a moment. You know exactly. What you know exactly means. what it yeah. means, but it's like, how do you communicate it's like it's like I can like I I would think we were talking beforehand. I can, I can tell you about my wife. Yes. Yeah. Right. I can tell you what she likes, all the all her tastes, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, but then once you meet her, that's a totally different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. encounter whatsoever. Sure. Right. That's a totally sure. different level of knowing someone whatsoever. But then to actually be her is something totally different. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I, in knowing her, and I, I know her pretty well, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've been married for 10 years. I mean, there's a lot more years to come, but sure. we've been married for 10 years. So we've gotten to know each other a little bit over the years. And um, the, 
that doesn't mean that I've seen her soul or seen her spirit or seen the essence of who she is. Mm -hmm. I've not actually seen her heart that's within her pumping Mm -hmm. blood, right? There's things about her I've never seen. And so I have a knowledge of her that's always going to be incomplete Mm -hmm. because there's things I could never hope to possibly perceive Mm -hmm. about her. Mm -hmm. And, and I think when we think about knowing God, would we, I'll say it this way. I, I think in the last year I have, I've started reading scripture a little bit differently. Hmm. And rather than sitting down and studying through a book, well, I mean, I still love to do, and I've done lots of that, but, but now predominantly, rather than sitting down and studying through a book, I've been going through the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Psalms. And and really the question is, who is Jesus? Hmm. How does he feel? How is he, how does he touch? What does he sound like? Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm realizing more, and I, and I think I just kind of, it was an imperceivable shift, and I'm starting to realize that I've done it now, is that when I read the Gospels, I'm reading the Gospels from how, how can I know, I, it makes me familiar with what he sounds like, what he feels like, right, right. What, he, what he seems like, what, all these things. Right. And, and it helps me to know him to an even greater degree. Yeah. And so I, I read not so much to study and exegete scripture, Yeah. Uh, which is something I used to do, right? And and, I, and I'm not devaluing that. I mean, it's it's I love doing that. And I love stu- reading a good exegetical work on course, a passage, yeah, yeah. right? Um, it, it, I I just I reading the what the early church fathers and all that. I mean, you look at guys at Origin who just pulled apart all kinds of scripture all the time, mm-hmm. right? Anyway, um, but I'm I'm just reading it, going, how does this teach me about who he is? Yeah. And how do I become more familiar with his presence and what he feels like when he comes and when he touches people? What kind of things does he say? What kind of movements does he make? It makes me, it makes me wonder too about this question of, um, you know, when you you use the example of, of, well, you reading scripture for that purpose, but also, you know, the way we know different people. Like, I wonder if, um, if there's a question in there about, you know, the way, uh, the way that you know your wife or I know you, you know, is different than the way your wife knows you or yes. your, be- your best friend yes. from your childhood knows you. And there is this sort of personal dimension to it too, where it's yes. like part of what's un- inexpressible about our, that, that heart, you know, burning within us, Yes. you know, where it's, it's a, it's a, a feeling that so many people can hear and say, yes, I know what that is, but yeah. I can't express that, you know, isn't that in some sense, I think, I mean, God speaks so directly into, uh, you know, us personally, yes. right? Yeah. Um, that uh, that there's certainly been moments in my life, as I'm sure there is in every in yours and in everyone's life, where you know we feel like you know God has just spoken directly to us in this way yeah. that uh, maybe other people have a have an experience of it, but it's it's inexpressible for me yes. to sort of say you know I've had this encounter or I've had this experience, uh, and it's those moments where it, it feels like God knows you know Josh right Josh's yes. heart or Colin's heart yes. or, or whoever um, yeah yeah I, I'm I well it's funny. Um, that it's funny that we even use the term feeling when we describe it, right? Because it's not I mean, usually what, when what we associate a feeling with an emotion. It's not really an emotion no, no. so much. And, and you have language to convey an emotion, but it's not. I mean, sometimes you, you're, you can feel the presence of God and there's joy associated with mm-hmm. it, right? But it's not the, the presence of God, the feeling of God. It's not an, it's not an emotional no. thing. It's and I, I think it probably the Old Testament using the term kabod, the weightiness, the glory of God is probably right. a better way of describing right. it, what yeah, it, yeah, what yeah. it feels like to be in Him and with Him. Yeah. And it, again, it's not a so, and that's the thing about knowledge, how knowledge, my knowledge is different than your knowledge, right? right? And and you're created differently than I'm created. Mm-hmm. And um, the you look at the various different people, like the the prophets in, and I think we talked about this in an earlier episode. The, the personality of the prophets comes through in how in how they record the sure. experiences that they have. Sure, yeah. So Isaiah highlights certain things. Ezekiel highlights certain things. Yeah, Abraham's perfectly aware of the blessing of God, and John the Baptist perfectly aware mm-hmm. of the blessing of God. Mm-hmm. But very different conversation between mm-hmm. the two. Um, and so that that so I just throw this out there, and we can talk about it. Maybe yeah. is um, when it comes to you know when we live. In, in, in the area we live in, era we live in, we talk about truth being your truth and my truth. Right. And right. Um, there's no there's no real established mm-hmm. um, relative or or absolute truth, mm-hmm. you know, and in, in, to use philosophical terms. Yeah. Um, and maybe 50 years ago, absolute truth was the Bible. Right. right. And uh, today, modern culture, that's just not the case. No. In what in the West, anyway. 
Yeah. Um, and, I, and so I've thought about that a lot, and I've realized that truth, uh, you know, the, the two kind of predominant, truth is relative, truth is absolute, the mm-hmm. two different. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, I've thought about that a lot, and I've thought, you know, in, in the sense that you're Colin and I'm Josh, truth is relative. Right. Because truth to you, who God is to you is different than who he is to me. Sure. By nature of our experiences with him. Sure. And he's, he's I, and I think you look at um, I, the, the various different ways history's communicated the redemptive nature of Christ, mm-hmm. uh, emphasizing freedom from bondage, emphasizing right. Right. Uh, the, the legal requirement mm-hmm. of holiness to emphasizing paying a ransom for you. You mm-hmm. know, every, every age seems to emphasize something sure, different. Sure, sure, sure. Because I think people experience them differently mm-hmm. uh, based on their life and all that. So you've got, you've got relative truth based on how you perceive things because of your life experience, but you've got absolute truth because God never changes. Right, right. And so all of those, all of those redemptive, the redemptive nature of God, all those things are true. Yes, yeah. Right, and yeah. The, the broader application, the broader understanding is all absolutely true and it never changes, but mm-hmm. the way we encounter it, engage it, we see it differently. Mm-hmm. And so you've got, you've got things that you know and believe about God. I've got things that I know and sure. I believe about God that's dictated really by life experience right. and, and our understanding and study of Scripture, of course. So in a way, I mean, we can say that, that, I mean, there is an absolute truth, you know, of God in God's self kind of thing. Yes, that's a great way. But then, but then in, in our, our lives, it's, it's not sort of a, a different truth. It's just a differently experienced truth. Yes, you yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's truth that's relative to who you are. Right. Right. And it's yeah. and it's truth that's relative to how you relate to him and how he's created mm. you to relate mm. to him. And and, you know, that the part of the, the kind of funny way of saying the, the problem is saying that truth is relative is that you're making an absolute statement about truth. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So right. how can you say truth is relative? It's like the only absolute thing about truth that you can yeah. say is that it's relative. Yeah. Right. And so that's the, the, the yeah. kind of incongruency there. Right? Yeah. But yet people make it. And so I come into I, the way that I come to know God is is as David said very very much driven by my experience of mm-hmm. God, and he, like he said, my heart's hot within me. Teach me to number my days. Yeah. So he's had he's having he's having this engagement with God, and he's learning in this engagement from, mm-hmm. with God about himself and about God. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think that's when you look at Scripture. Scripture, yes, is the re- the revelation of the Trinity of of the Godhead to mankind, mm-hmm. but it also shows us how mankind encountered and engaged God, almost like a blueprint, right. if you think, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah, just yeah. kind of go, "Oh, Jeremiah experienced him this way, Paul experienced him this way, mm-hmm. um, and John the Baptist experienced him this way." That we've got we've got the revelation that God actually comes to you yeah. and reveals Himself to yeah. you, though it's. It's imperceptible in his in the the grandness of his nature. He dwells in unapproachable light. Yet he longs to be known, or he mm. desires to be known. Mm. It seems too like that's like th- there's a way in which through all of this we come to know a lot more about ourselves, but not in a kind of selfish way, but about ourselves in relationship to God. Yes. Right? And I think that for me, you know, we're in the season of Lent right now, and uh, you know, a lot of Lent is about. Um, you know, self-discipline and uh, self-denial. And it's all about, you know, giving up the things of this world to better attune our spiritual senses to God and to, uh, you know, the the coming of the uh, Jesus' death and and resurrection and that sort of thing. But I'm I'm wondering if there's, um, you know, that knowledge of God, even though it's it's sort of unique to each person, we know God in a different way. There is, um, you know, there is this sense in which we are, coming to know ourselves in relationship to God. And the Gospels talk about that sort of self-denial, right? Yes. Um, is, is part of that, is that what we come to know is that it's not really about us. Yes. You know, you know yes. I mean, that's sort of a universal a universal knowledge in some way that we can have about God's truth. Yeah. Um, uh, even though God sort of speaks to us in this personal and individual way, or we at yeah. least experience that truth personally and individually. And I think, I mean, you you, you want to be careful in, in again, in our in our modern individualistic society mm-hmm. to remove we talked about the we talked about the personal revelation of god to remove right. it from the corporate expression of course and yeah. the and the grand narrative in scripture sure. of who so we're because we're part of this grand narrative right we're right. part of right. this history we're yeah. part of we're part of you know however long you think creation's been around we're part of this whole thing yeah and so we're not isolated and separate in the sense that he speaks to you individually so that makes me 
separate and different yeah. as a brother from you. No, of course. Yeah. Right? That that's actually one of the things that bonds us together and mm-hmm. makes the shared story of who you are. One of the things one of the reasons we do a podcast mm-hmm. like this is because sure. your background and my background are very different. And so we get to learn from each other mm-hmm. and we come to realize that it's the same God who works in all things and all things, right? As scripture yeah. says. But but I learn from you and you learn from me. Yeah. And, and we learn from the viewers out there course, as they comment yeah, and they and they like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and the more likes and shares and subscribes, the more we get to know them, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so there's um, there's this unfolding of who he is that that happens mm. as I as I as I hear stories from people about who he is. It's well, the, 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 it's the, here. Here we go. Here's the great prayer, the August Augustinian, mm-hmm. <laughs> Augustinian. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get the some of the podcasts I've been listening to. They do the Augustine thing, and I just can't. Augustine, okay. Augustine, not with the e. And you're Augustine, Augustine, yeah, Augustine. Augustine. Yeah. Anyway, um, his that great guy. prayer, uh, something along these lines. Lord, teach me to know myself that I might know you. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Let me come in contact with what's in my own heart. Yeah. Because without knowing myself, how am I going to one differentiate between mm-hmm. me and God? Because you know, I, we'd, in the in the uh, charismatic church, we kind of joke that when we're teaching teaching people, we kind of joke that you your opinion becomes God's opinion, right? That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you if you can't yeah deny that part of yourself, or not, I mean, it's not even a denial in the sense that uh, you know it's it's worthless or anything, mm-hmm. but uh, recognize that there's an aspect of me I I. I want to be successful in life, so therefore God must want me to be successful in mm-hmm, life. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what that looks like and all of that stuff is filtered through my own opinion. So if I'm, if I'm not aware of what's in here, what's going on, do I need to know myself in order to even have sure. any hope of knowing Sure, that? sure, sure. Uh, my, my heart has to be revealed to myself. Yeah. And, yeah. and only he can do that. He is, he is, it says he, Psalm 33, I think it is, he fashioned their hearts alike. Mm-hmm. He knows every single one of them. Mm-hmm. He's the one that gave you your heart. Mm-hmm. I love um, the the growing up in a in the, in the church environment I grew up in, and I think this is probably maybe it's across the board. Uh, Jeremiah seventeen nine was a really mm-hmm. important verse for people. Your heart is deceitful and wicked above all things, right? Right, and that's so. You're it's hammered home. Your yeah. your heart is evil. Your heart is wicked. Yeah. And I was never taught really the the flip side of that was the grand promise. That, that happens in Ezekiel and then um, the writer of Hebrews pulls on is God no longer has given, he gives you a new heart. Hmm. You don't have a heart of stone anymore. You have a heart of flesh. Right. And so we, we, we had in, in the way the gospel was presented to me is that you just had to realize how evil and awful you were. Right. And yes, there's an aspect of that. Absolutely. Sure. The, 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 sure. I, I, you know, as, as having certain problems with Calvinism, total depravity is not a problem I have with Calvinism. Right. right. That's that. <laughs> yes. Mankind is totally depraved yep. and you give, you give man, anybody, you give enough power, you give them enough money. Yeah. They're going to screw everything up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's going to the dogs. It's going to the dogs. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But there's, there's, there's an aspect of the gospel where God begins to reveal this heart that he's given to you. That's yeah. different than the heart that's deceitful and wicked. Yeah. But it's still hit the heart that he's given to you. So, mm. It's not, it's not, it's not exactly like, you know, what's in there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's still one that he's given to you. So you can only know it by knowing him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You can only know the deceitful one by knowing him because he reveals that to you. Yeah. Most people yeah. ignore the fact that their heart is deceitful and wicked of course. and yeah. try and try and surround themselves with things that make them, uh, that cause distance from their heart mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and who they are, you know, yeah. whether it's iPhones, whether it's sure. certain car brands or, you know, whatever yeah. it is, we surround ourselves by thing by things to distract us from the, the truth, the reality of Absolutely. total depravity that's within. Yeah. But God longs to give you a new heart. Yeah. That's no longer a heart that's wicked and deceitful, but mm-hmm. it's a heart that's soft, caring and compassionate mm-hmm. and tender. Mm-hmm. And like, I remember one time I was, uh, when I was really, I first moved up to Canada and I was uh, interning with the ministry that I eventually was running in, in Canada. Um, I, I had a moment, uh, in prayer, um, I was sitting outside early in the morning, just enjoying the presence of the father. Mm. And I heard, he just whispered something to me and it was the simplest, it was the simplest statement. And he said, I'm so proud of you. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, anybody can say that statement to you and you can shuck it off. Right. Yeah. It's, there's nothing 
there's nothing particularly special about the words, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, that moment, those words touched a deep part of myself. Mm -hmm. And I just started crying and mm -hmm. crying and crying. The, the realization that he didn't reject me. Yeah. The realization that it, it, it wasn't so much. It, and it, I, didn't, I don't think when he says something like that, I don't think the pride he has in me is something inherently that makes me go, well, look how great I am. No, of course. It yeah. was, yeah. I'm so broken and I'm such a mess. But, and yeah. you've, but yet you've still yeah. chosen me. And you've still looked through that and pulled me up. Mm. That became such a demarcation moment in that period of my life. Mm. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. And I, just, I lived in that for a while of God doesn't reject me. He still loves me mm. in spite of all mm -hmm. the stuff mm -hmm. and everything I've done. And there was some pretty horrendous stuff that I had done. Sure. But he still loved me. Yeah. 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 So... What, we've got a couple more minutes left. What, yeah. Can you think of any um, experiences in your own life where God kind of spoke through the, the, the gloom? and? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I, the one I think of, and I, you know, it's, um, you know, I've had a lot of time now for a couple of years to think about it. And it's, uh, you know, I, I tell it freely and willingly to everyone because I'm, you know, it was such a like moving moment. But right. uh, in 2015, my, um, just around this time, actually March 20th, my father died very suddenly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, that spring, I had been doing a, a placement in a church uh, in Halifax. And one of the things we had to do for that placement in our student placement was to, to construct like a study or a course and then run it, like at right. least four or five nights sort of thing. Could be on scripture, it could be on, you know, theology or the spiritual life or whatever. And I perceived at that time that in the church, there was a lot of people, it was a fairly big church, there was a lot of people with cancer, with, um, you know, just suffering, like just yeah. illness. And yeah. People were really having a tough time understanding why is this happening to me, right? Just those age-old questions people have surrounding right. surrounding sickness and, and illness in the church. And so I came up with this course called, uh, I think it was called Understanding Suffering and Death or Understanding Illness and Death from right. a Christian Perspective. Right. And it drew on fathers, it drew on scripture, all this stuff. And so I ran it for four weeks and I ended it on Thursday, March 19th. And on Thursday, Friday, March 20th, my father died. And it was like, I, I don't know if I was the first one to think about it, but the, the priest at that church at the time, the pastor said, like, God prepared you for this. Wow. Right? This wasn't right. coincidental. Wow. And I look back on that and I'm just like, you know, it, he did. Yeah. Right? Because that, that, you know, the next day we were at the hospital and I'm having to call family and do this. And, and I'm sort of, you know, reasonably young in my sort of spiritual mm -hmm. journey and I'm having to figure this all out. Right. And I just think back to everything I'd read and all of that. And I just, you know, that's a moment for me that just stands out as right. like, like the like boom the presence of god with me right you know and and knowing in that moment that i'm not uh, you know i'm not alone i'm not left right um in the midst of in the midst of difficulty in the midst of yeah. suffering and all of yeah. that his tender heart was still there with sure you. yeah, and, yeah. And, and before it like working and not just after it but like working me to you know prepare me for right. this right which kind of blew my mind about how god works in time and all this yes. stuff too you know but um yeah yeah that's because thinking about the the eternal quality of god or the timelessness of him is yeah he he had he knew everything that was going to happen yeah yeah and put the thought into you to Absolutely. go you should prepare this yeah and and that and that's just your story right there's people that came into your course yeah 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 that right. probably the outworking of what you taught them impacted them in some sure. way too, right? Yeah. All of the intersecting lives and journeys. And I, I think once, once we get with him mm. and we're able to see the tapestry he wove right, right, between right, everybody and right. we go, my goodness, yeah. this is absolutely incredible. Yeah. How, did you, how did you do that? Yeah. How did you possibly, because he's not just working, he wasn't just working in you, he's working in all of them. Everybody yeah. that was around, absolutely. That's that's wow. He's, he is absolutely incredible. It's knowing him is yeah. the greatest privilege of this. It life. is. It is. And uh, so we just want to thank you guys uh, for joining us and for listening and putting up with Colin and I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and just kind of our rambling thoughts and everything. Yeah. And so we hope that this was helpful. Uh, that we want to know what you think. What what are ways that you've encountered the life of God? Uh, what are ways that he's come to you? What are tender moments that you've had with yeah. him? What does it mean to you to know the life of God? Want, comment on the Facebook stuff. Uh, comment on the YouTube stuff. Send us an email. Uh, all those all those types of things. Visit the website. Let us know what your thoughts are. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. And so please Absolutely. like, share, and subscribe. Uh, silentfire.ca.